What's going on, Sats fans? It's another primetime episode of Swan Signal Live with your boys Preston Pish and Andy Edstrom. I'm excited for this one, just like I am every single time that we do this show. Um, but first, a little bit about the producer of the show, Swan Bitcoin. I'm Brady Swenson, your host. I'm the head of education at Swan Bitcoin. And our goal is to create 10 million new Bitcoiners. Um, and this is not just, just people who own Bitcoin, people who understand Bitcoin, why Bitcoin matters, how it works, and what it means for our future. And so to do that, uh, we need to be a partner with you and your friends, your family, and everybody else at SWAN on your Bitcoin journey. So we're dedicated to providing education to our clients through email series by Brandon Quidham uh, that begin as soon as we, you become a SWAN client to uh, making high quality Bitcoin books freely available, to making ourselves available uh, to answer any of Bitcoin questions that you have. Uh, we're, we talk Bitcoin with our clients all the time, not just people writing in to ask about you know, the product or the service or an issue here or there. People write in and ask us all the time about Bitcoin and wanna learn and we're happy to have those conversations and direct them toward resources that will help answer their questions in the best way possible. There's so much great Bitcoin content out there and we refer people all over the place um, we get questions, uh, you know, directly for our staff, um, from, you know, who are all of course, well-versed in Bitcoin. And, uh, we have, we do that all day long. We talk to people on Twitter, we talk to people through email. We talk to people in direct chats, uh, on our site. We talk on clubhouse, talk on YouTube. We have this podcast feed. Uh, so we're all over the place talking Bitcoin and you know what, it's not really a job. It's just fun. It's a, it's amazing fun and an honor really to be trying to do our small part to shepherd this thing to um, adoption in the best way possible. You can sign up at swanbitcoin.com today. We'd be honored to join you on your Bitcoin journey and, you know, feel, I hope you'll, you can feel, uh, you know, safe and, and trusted. You can trust us to help you and your family members as well. Uh, so you can send them our way. We'll take good care of them. Obviously no shit coins here, just pure long-term thinking and education. You can also sign up for SwanForce at swanbitcoin.com slash enlist and grab yourself a ref URL and use that to uh, orange pill your friends and family. And you'll stack 25% of uh, the fees on all of their purchases. We have people stacking some mad sats and it's really fun to watch. Uh, we've got the Swan Force really just growing. Uh, we have the number of people who are really just seeing returns and you know trying to figure out how to make the most of this thing are growing. Our uh, uh, Camilla Campton is running the Swan Force. And so she's talking to Swan Force members every day about how they can recruit new Bitcoiners more effectively and stack those sets. Um, we provide, of course, these education services and referrals for, for every customer. Um, but if you become a member of Swan Private at swanbitcoin.com slash private, you'll have access to our dedicated uh, account representatives. Uh, you'll receive the monthly Swan Private Insight Report. We provide assistance on uh, tax forms and retirement accounts, self-custody guidance, as well as wire buys with no limits. We're starting up a monthly uh, exclusive webinar. Uh, we just had Stefan Levera of the Stefan Levera podcast join the team. So he's working as managing director of international on the Swan private team, uh, which is really exciting. So uh, we'd love to work with any and all of you. Um, we strive to get better every day. If you have any questions for us, please reach out at hello at swanbitcoin.com. All right, let's dive into this episode with Andy and Preston. What's up, gentlemen? Hey, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Nowhere I'd rather be than with you gentlemen right now. It's always fun. It's Likewise. always fun to hang out with you guys. <laughs> it's been about five months since we've done one of these. I think, I don't know, we've done five or six of these now. And, uh, you know, the the fans are uh, out there. You know, we, we put this tweet out there today and they're like, oh, you're getting the band back together finally. And uh, people have come to really love this pairing and, and these kind of recap episodes where we look back on what's happened uh, in Bitcoin and macro and then look forward as well and make some predictions, uh, which... Uh, Andy called out on Twitter today. It's been about a year to the day, right? Or, you know, to the week, maybe, where we had an episode that Preston predicted an all-time high by Christmas of last year. He was he hit it pretty close, right, Andy? Yeah, like within a couple weeks, I think it was. Pretty impressive. <laughs> there you go. Better to be so, lucky so than Preston, good. <laughs> let's get this out of the way right now. Uh, all-time high by Christmas. New all-time uh, high by Christmas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That one's not even hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 100K by Christmas? Yeah, I think so. Sweet. 
Love the, it. the only Love caveat, it. yeah, the only caveat I'd have is it really kind of comes down to what's happening in the in the macro economy. So when we go and we look at the March of 2020 event and just kind of the supply demand shock that you had that took place, the impairment yeah. across all asset classes, the only thing that was the only thing that you could own through all of that was fiat currency, believe it or not, that was going to perform well. Um, and I mean, could I see something like that happening between now and the end of the year? Yeah, I could actually see something like that happening between now and the end of the year. And I think the thing that would cause it is uh, all the uh, supply chain issues that we have right now, which I think are way worse than what anybody is talking about on the financial news or uh, really kind of anywhere. I think it's actually really bad. Now, whether that will actually materialize into some type of cascading uh, sell-off that you see across the board and impairment across the board, I have no idea if it's going to materialize between now and the end of the year. But if it would, that would be the only thing that would prevent Bitcoin from going over 100,000. Yeah, I saw you tweet about that and you got a lot of anecdotes, anecdotal stories, I guess, about supply chain issues on that thread. Hundreds oh of God. comments. That was yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 If people I haven't mean, seen it, go to my Twitter. Um, unfortunately, it's probably like pushed pretty far down there. But um, I think there was close to a thousand comments in that thread. And I mean, there isn't one comment in that thread that's just a, a throwaway comment. It's kind of insane to see every single sector being impacted by this. Um, I, I think it's a way bigger story than people are paying attention to right now. So can I jump in there? Um, first of all, I was one of the comments. Um, our oven crapped out and we had to get a new one. And the one we wanted isn't available for months. So we had to get a different one, which did come in, I think, a month. So I have one of those one of those stories that's number one and then number two i think the only other thing i'd uh i'd throw in there's a possible you know rating on the on the bitcoin parade would just be the fed right you know uh the big annual jackson hole conference where um federal reserve members who are not politicians except for their giving speeches uh go yeah. figure uh all get together uh <laughs> You know, Jackson Hole, on, I think on Friday, and uh, our our friend Powell's going to give a big speech. And, you know, financial markets and basically all investors out there are trying to figure out, you know, is the Fed going to taper? When are they going to taper? You know, basically, when are they going to start uh, letting a little bit of air out of the balloon? And, you know, we can debate whether that's actually going to happen. But I guess that if it were to actually happen then that could be sort of a macro event that takes a little wind out of the sails for Bitcoin. Having said yeah. that, I'm very bullish. Yeah, all-time high this year is what I'm expecting. 100K, I think there's a very good shot. And if not this year, then you know, likely next year, like early and, next year. And this is something else I would add, Brady, is mm -hmm. if, if we would go through one of those March-like events of 2020, which would be supply chain-induced, um, you're going to have a response from central banks that is going to top and be more extreme than what you actually saw with COVID, in my opinion. Um, I think that the, the response is going to be just unfathomable, to be quite honest with you. Um, and so you're going to have that, that the, the same type of rebound that you saw uh, then, maybe not at the pace, but you're going to have some type of bounce that's associated with that. And Bitcoin is going to just crush it in that type of setting. So um, is, is it something that worries me? Is it something that scares me? No, I, it's just one of those things that you just, uh, you know, just buy and hold. I mean, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing too complicated to do here. Um, it's if, not complicated, but it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Yeah. And I think the, the longer you've been in the space, the easier it gets, obviously, but um, don't overthink this. Like there's nothing complicated about it. It's important that you identify what are free cash flows versus what is money that are fiat that I need in order to pay for my, my expenses, the fixed expenses that I have in my life, uh, which are denominated in fiat. You need to make sure that you're able to separate that and whatever your free cash flows are and you're pumping them into Bitcoin and it's, it's volatile against fiat. Don't worry about it. Just let it go. Yeah, I mean you got to be in a place where you're, you know, not freaking out when there's a yeah. 30 40% drop. I mean the so we've seen on this cycle it's been a little different. I mean maybe it's we'll see how it plays out. Maybe it's more similar to 2013 than the previous cycle. Um do you think like we saw about a 50% pull down? 
Do you think that we will ever see again this like 90% kind of drops? Or are we at a point now where uh, we've got enough kind of broader conviction of the idea that, you know, this thing is to hold for the long term. This thing has long term potential. Do you think we've gotten to the point now where it's 12 years old that, uh, you know, we'll have more hodlers coming in every cycle that might keep, you know, the downside to more in the 40 to 50 percent range at any on any drop? Yeah. Okay. I'll take a shot at that one. So first of all, yes, every uh, downdraft that we've seen, I'm talking about the big ones, has been smaller than the last, right? In the early years, it was down, you know, 95% from peak and then it was down 90 and then it was down 85, I think, in the in the bear market following 2017. And then, you know, more recently, it, it, it was a, a smaller downturn. So that's so history says yes. As the market gets bigger, you know, as the ship gets bigger, it's less tossed around on the waves. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. is market structure. So the more institutionalized we get, and by the way, I don't think this market is very institutionalized yet. I'm sure we'll we'll talk about that more soon. But the more institutionalized Next. we get, I do think, you know, the more likely there's going to be dip buyers. And also perhaps the inverse, you know, these uh a lot of these hedge fund guys have uh, have ice running through their veins. They don't mind selling a top, right? And we may have seen some of that, honestly, mm -hmm. a few months ago, right? That may have been part of the story. So I I, I do think that uh, there's going to be less vol on price in future. That's my personal view. And the only thing to me that can that can uh, screw that up really is is leverage. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I I I published an article in March uh, on BTC Times which I think is uh, backed by Samson Mao, among others. Uh, at Preston just did a great episode with uh, with mm -hmm. Samson and Dr. Adam Back. People should definitely, definitely check that out. Um, and, you know, the message is basically, you know, don't don't go long and levered. And unfortunately, I think a lot of plebs learned the hard way what being long and levered looks like um, a few months ago. And yeah, you know, leverage is the one thing that can uh, that can sort of uh, send this train off the tracks in terms of the magnitude of the downturns. But by and large, I do think that the downturns are going to be smaller in the future than they than they have been in the past. I um I don't know that I have an opinion one way or the other. I guess I'm I'm prepared for large downturns, and I think it's important for people to kind of keep that frame of reference and that those can happen. When I'm thinking about it, you got to kind of see where you're at in the cycle. So we just saw a 50% downturn where China turned off literally half of the hardware for the entire network. And um, and it manufactured, a, it produced, in my opinion, it produced a 50% downturn in the in the price action because of that uh, event that wasn't, I don't, I don't think it was expected by people within the country. And they had heavily denominated Bitcoin balance sheets and they have to sell that in order to, to offset all those uh, extraordinary costs that their companies then uh, experienced. So you saw a 50% downturn at a time where Bitcoin was tightening severely mm -hmm. and you still produced a 50% downturn. So I have to ask myself, what if that event would have happened and we would have been kind of uh, realizing this big giant blow off top and then it was starting to pull back. And then you got hit with an event like the one that we just experienced. Could you see an 80% downturn? I think you might be able to still see an 80% downturn in, in a situation like that. Now, China's already sold all their, <laughs> they're out of the game, right? So uh, is that risk still there? I don't know, but I guess I just use it as kind of a demonstrative kind of way of it, if a couple of things kind of line up. And depending on where you're at in the cycle and depending on what macro event is playing out, like, sure, I think you can still see some pretty like crazy moves and, and crazy moves to the upside as well. Like um, it's not just one way. It's just yeah. you got something that let's just call it a trillion dollars. You got something that's a trillion dollar market cap that's trying to be uh, a 50, 100 trillion plus market cap uh, size. So like volatility is part of it. People need to prepare themselves for that type of volatility. So. I just don't want to really say I think those days are over because I think that maybe you could still see some craziness depending on what's playing out. And I think there's plenty of craziness to play out in the macro economy with the fixed income market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the macro events. So you, I think maybe Bitcoin, you know, it, given a more kind of like the last 10 years of the macro economy, right? The 
uh, relative stability, uh, you might say, at least confidence in the macro economy uh, over the past 10 or 12 years, then I think you certainly would see less volatility moving forward. But you have to take into account that this is, uh, we're, we're definitely entering treacherous waters. We're already in the treacherous waters. Um, so how, let's talk about this infrastructure bill a little bit. And just in general, uh, you know, what the Fed is doing, what they're forecasting or foreshadowing, and um, maybe what they're, I mean, if, if they even have any options anymore at this point, um, they might be forced, right? So the infrastructure bill um, is, a, I think, a topic that we can discuss a couple of things on. One is just, you know, the magnitude of the printing, additional printing that's happening, right? Um, I think Preston tweeted today about the one and a half trillion dollar bill that went over to the house and is getting kicked back at three and a half trillion, which I'd love to hear more about if, uh, if you have any more details there. And then, of course, the definition of broker uh, in the bill uh, and the debate over the amendments, lots to discuss there. Uh, big thing that happened in the past month or two. So I would love to hear your comments uh, on either of those aspects of the infrastructure bill. Andy, do you want to kick it off? Oh, I was going to say, I want to hear Preston explain. You want to go Preston first? I, I want to hear him explain how to spend three and a half trillion dollars. <laughs> it's like Brewster's <laughs> Billion. Have you ever watched that show, uh, the movie? That's what I'm thinking about when I'm seeing it. I mean, you crack open these bills and I mean, there's just stuff in here that you just, uh, you, you can't even like wrap your head around what some of it is. And I mean, it's, it's elected officials voting money into their districts. They're incentivized to act this way. It shouldn't surprise anybody. Yeah. Um, and as much that they can, that they can put in there as possible, the better, because you're at a point in time now where it's politically popular for both parties to just spend it will. There's yep. nobody. There's nobody that's seeking re-election that is going to get re-election by saying, you know, I think we need to be responsible right now, folks. Um, that's just not. That's not in the cards. Um, I think it's kind of obvious why it's not in the cards. And to be honest with you, on a global standpoint, on an, like an international standpoint, a country that would actually, um, and this isn't a popular opinion. It's not something that I think is in the best interest of of our country or, or mankind, but I think you're at a point now that the competitive printing between nation states, if you're not doing this, if you're mm -hmm. not debasing your currency, the only thing that's going to happen is your currency is going to tighten. The, the buying power for you goes up, but the problem with that is all the cost and, and everything uh, overseas go up too in terms of... Or, the, the cost of your goods to sell overseas go up here domestically. And so you, you're, you're not capturing that flow it's kind of, of a wash. capital. Yeah. It's so yeah. it's a wash. So um, you have this incentive that's, that's in place where it's popular, both parties, they, they want to print as much as they can. They want to vote this into their, on the fiscal side, they want to vote it into their districts. And um, that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. And I don't see it slowing down. It's if anything, it's going to accelerate and, and maybe accelerate quite a bit. Um, the problem that you're running into with all this is it's creating these massive disruptions in just uh, how economic calculation is taking place for workers. That's why you can't find workers right now. You combine it with the UBI. It's, it's crazy. But um, none of this is slowing down anytime soon. Uh, like, like the post, you know, one, we started off at 1.5 out of the Senate. They kick it over to the, to the House side and they tack on another $2 trillion. So, uh, you tell me. I mean, I, I don't know how this could possibly end at this point. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree completely with Preston. Um, you know, to go in a different direction, you know, Brady, you mentioned the, you know, what happened with the bill recently. Um, I don't know if I want to like rehash, you know, the, the machinations that went on politically. Mm -hmm. I will say one thing, which is um, I believe that as Bitcoiners, we can do better in the political realm. I consider myself as delinquent as anyone else out there in the sense that, you know, I try to uh, do my best to help educate people about Bitcoin, but I really haven't done much in the political realm, uh, including open my wallet, right? Um, you know, I'm sure there'll, there'll be uh, some folks listening who are totally anti-government, you know, Basically, let's just build this thing and, and go around them. I actually don't take that view. Um, I prefer that I prefer that we make America maximally safe uh, for Bitcoin. And uh, I do think that, you know, I do think that basically lobbying and making the right moves uh, politically, backing the right candidates 
is something that probably the whole community can do better at. And I'm as guilty as, or as delinquent as anyone. And I do think that, uh, you know, I'd like to do better in that regard. And I think, um, a lot of us could too. Yeah, that's really emerging. I think is, um, you know, you, you see this uh, happening on Twitter too. people changing their, um, handles or their names to, you know, single issue voter. And so there's a block of, of Bitcoiners out there that are growing and going to vote for Bitcoin candidates, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin friendly candidates on either side of the aisle. Um, and so something that was interesting to me about the bill and I, that I think is really important was the bipartisan nature of that, you know, amendment debate and the sponsors of those amendments, which I think was really important to kind of set the tone that this is not just, uh, you know, Bitcoin's not just for libertarians or whatever. It's it's not necessarily, um, you know, a single party issue or whatever, but it can be a single issue um, political vote, you know, driver, I guess. Um, what, what do you guys think of the White House coming out and backing the amendment that included only proof of work proof miners of work. the exception yeah. for pr proof of work miners uh in the bro definition of broker uh i thought that was a really interesting move and then also during that debate um it, it seemed that you know elizabeth warren who had been very vocal you know especially on energy stuff uh came out and softened her stance on crypto in general i read that as maybe a setup for a fed coin kind of thing possibly but still interesting so what do you guys think about um, just the politics around that amendment process? What do you think it reveals about where we're headed uh, in political debate for Bitcoin? Uh, anybody who had like a hard stance seemed to kind of back off of it as we were going through that that developmental process um, in the Senate. So uh, the thing that it's telling me is they're getting a lot of phone calls. Uh, people might not think that the phone calls do anything, but and, and for all intents and purposes, if they get three phone calls, probably not. But if they're getting like hundreds or thousands of calls and every single person's leaving a, a message and they're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. Um, you better believe that they're trying to learn and understand it more than just blowing it off because they know if they got a thousand calls on day one or within the first three days, um, they're saying there's something big out there that's brewing and they just you know, they just got to do more research and understand it. So I think that's kind of what was taking place, at least there at, at the Senate. Um, I would expect a whole lot more of that, especially if you start getting into like the buyer bill. A lot of what I think you just saw with the infrastructure bill is people just trying to make sure that the terminology that's being used in that bill isn't preventative for uh, future uh, laws that might come out uh, later on so that there's not some type of precedence that's put in place. Now, yep. your comment on the White House, uh, you know, coming out with language that was specific to proof of work was super interesting to me, especially um, considering there's this whole narrative, especially with the current administration um, around ESG and all of the concerns that that seem to kind of percolate up about how proof of work is bad for the environment. We all know the the real story there, but that's not what I would have expected to see come out of out of yeah. their administration. So it really, I, when I saw that and I read it, I just kind of laughed. I said, this is getting <laughs> more interesting by the hour. Right. Um, so in the long run, I just don't think any of it matters. And, and all this stuff that they're doing right now is two years out or whatever the timeline is. I mean, what could happen right. between now and two years in the financial markets and Bitcoin specifically, I mean, give me a break. Yeah, yeah absolutely. that's well said. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, I was ha when I saw the the POW you know only language come out you know I was sort of quietly cheering that's <laughs> that's what I felt in my heart but yeah. what I felt in my head or what I know in my head is actually the innovation imperative you know is the important thing so right. even hardcore maximalist bitcoiners are better off if you know the door is left open to lots of quote unquote innovation in the quote unquote crypto space um we're better off i believe uh you know letting a thousand or ten thousand flowers bloom you know because that's just more time for bitcoin to grow stronger and meaner and more unkillable and uh, <laughs> even if even if it's already unkillable um you know it's good to uh it's good for the other coins to uh to take flack you know provide covering fire um 
for uh, for Big Daddy Bitcoin. That's my personal view. Now, I'll take um, you know I'll poke back a little bit with respect to your comment about Bitcoin being a bipartisan issue. I'm not sure that's great for Bitcoin, to be honest with you. Um, I would almost rather see Bitcoin becoming a polarized, you know, issue for one party or the other. Um, I think that at least in the short term, you know, when you get when you get one side, one team, red or blue, as the case may be, and I happen to believe that in this case it would likely be red. But if you get one team behind it, um, I think that it's got a better shot at uh, you know being protected at least as it relates to uh to the law in this country but i'll throw that out there and see uh you know see if preston agrees or disagrees i yeah i don't i don't think i agree with you um i think at the end of the day both parties are going to view it for what it is and that's a campaign donation that can assist in the marketing and branding of their re-election campaign which i think is yeah. paramount to anything else um so um, yeah, I, I kind of think that both sides are going to view it from a lens that, Hey, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything negative about this thing, especially when these people are doing a hundred percent annually on their returns. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cause I just see that as campaign contributions and, and make no mis no mistake about it. Um, when you, when you're understanding the incentive structure of, of an elected official, one of the very top things there is campaign contributions, because if you can run three times as many ads against your competition, like your chances of, of, of winning that election go up way more than what people uh, think that influence really has on them. It's, it's way higher than I think people realize. So the money's super important in re-election campaigns, and I don't think that any of them are going to try to, uh, you know, buck the system or try to say, hey, I don't like that thing where all those people are making a bunch of money. Yeah. And I, I mean, I disagree too. I think that it'd be better for Bitcoin. I think it actually has a better chance. I mean, uh, imagine having an issue like this that uh, is actually agreed upon. It's We're so polarized right now. And I think having something to unify around and there's narratives that fit, you know, all political stripes. Honestly, this is what Bitcoin is about, right? It's there's something for everyone <laughs> in Bitcoin. I mean, it's it's fixing you know, things and issues that are important to uh, people of all political stripes. And so I think, um, you know, seeing the power of the Bitcoin lobby, if you want to put it that way, grow the single issue lobby, grow over, you know, significantly uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, you know, I, I, for one, will be supporting, you know, lots of different Bitcoin candidates and, uh <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that will continue as well on uh, or for a lot of Bitcoiners. Um, I, I would. I mean, I just want to put it out there that I want to see a Bitcoin only lobby, like lobbying company or firm, uh, like Coin Center, but a Bitcoin only version. Uh, and I would love to see that well funded by Bitcoiners. And like, let's get that started up. I put it out there on Twitter. There was a lot of engagement on it, so I think there's a lot of Bitcoiners out there who agree. And uh, I don't know, you know, how to go about that. But if anybody watching uh, or listening has an idea, uh, hit me up on Twitter and let's, you know, see if we can get some people to get it together to get the ball rolling on that. Steven had an awesome comment, uh, there in the comments section where he's talking about Bitcoin when it's attacked, it just gets stronger. If there's mm -hmm. one thing I've learned through all the years of being in this space, that statement is so true. Um, you could look at the, this China ban that they just did as an attack against Bitcoin, where 50% of the hardware was taken offline. A person who's looking at in the very short, you know, myopic point of view would say, oh, this is going to be bad for Bitcoin. This is going to be terrible. And we saw the price come down and like that narrative would run. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we all learn and we all know that any attack against Bitcoin has only made the thing stronger. It's like a Hydra. You cut one head yeah. two two come out of it. And now we have hardware that's more decentralized across the globe. It got stronger. Um, of course, the difficulty adjustment immediately uh, assisted those that were still mining. They got yep. deep in the in the margin uh, mining it. It was extremely beneficial for them. And of course, it just comes screaming right back. You're seeing all this hashing power coming online. So bravo for the comment, uh, Stephen. I completely agree with you. Um, yes. Any attack, any legislation that is negative towards it 
It might be a short-term negative for whatever geographic uh, location you're in, but on a global scale, watch out. The thing just grew another head. Yeah, exactly. I just want to underscore that and talk a little bit about the mining you know, business in the United States, which is obviously you know, a huge beneficiary of, of this whole movement and migration. Um, I hope we don't see you know forty or fifty percent of the hash rate moving to America. You know, twenty to thirty would be would be about right. Um, but I think that one of the interesting things to think about is the you know the technical sell pressure, obviously that must have hit the miners leaving China. Because if you're a miner leaving China, number one, you're mostly probably private company. You know, relatively undercapitalized. You know, you you mine coins and you sell them, and that's how you make cash flow. And if all of a sudden your uh, revenue ceases because you have to move, then obviously you're selling a piece, piece of your stash, bunch of coins mm -hmm. get dropped on the market. That's a negative event. Okay. So contrast that, I think, with a mining operation, your, your average mining operation in the US. There's a couple of public companies, for one thing. And secondly, I think the capital markets now, from what I'm hearing, from the deals that are getting funded uh, in the US, I'm talking about mining companies you know, raising money, um, Blockstream mm -hmm. would be would be a very recent example, you know, multi billion dollar valuation. Um, you know, I think we're going to see a future in which, if and when there's pressure on miners, or if and when there's a downturn in the market, I don't think they're going to be selling coins. They're going to be in a position where they're saying, "Okay, price is down. Um, you know, how do I want to basically bootstrap my way through this cash flow issue?" Well, I'm probably more likely to just go raise capital on the market, you know, whether right. it's borrowing or even issuing equity, that's yeah. better than having to sell coins in a downturn. And so, yeah, I think that some of the things that are going on with the, let's say, institutionalization of the mining space on average are going to be uh, are going to be real positive. Uh, yeah. With respect to future, let's say, sh mining shocks and uh, the need of miners basically to sell coins at an inopportune time. I mean, if you're looking at the M2 money supply growth rate, and let's say that it is at 15%, well, now you kind of understand what your hurdle rate is as far as the equity valuation for a miner, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you, can do that, you can do that math real fast by basically taking 15% as a discount rate. And anything as far as your market cap above that as a miner, I mean, I'm issuing stock in order to raise money. Heck yeah. I mean, I don't think there's a coincidence that, uh, you know, Blockstream raised 210 million uh, when they launched their their mining business. Yeah. Um, I don't think all of that is going to be CapEx. You know, that's that's going to be held so that they can hold coins, uh, you know, for, I mean, they'll probably be able to operate off that for quite a long time. Um, and I don't think Adam's going to be selling those coins. <laughs> Uh, so it, it is amazing to see what's happened uh, in the mining industry over the past year. And not, not only the China thing, which was awesome. And I loved seeing, you know, plebs on Twitter, uh, scooping up cheap S nines, you know, for like six weeks, uh, before the prices shot back up and plugging them in and showing, you know, showing off their pictures of them in the setups in the basements with like, you know, 10 rigs in a, in a rack downstairs and, and plugging into compass mining and other pools and stuff. It, it's uh, it was awesome to see. Um, so, you, like you said, Preston, I mean, it was decentralized, not just to to other institutional companies, but you even uh, made it you know accessible to individuals, which you know you don't you don't see as much uh, in, in in Bitcoin mining anymore. I like to see that. Um, we have you know upstream data. We have Great American Mining. We've got now uh, Blockstream providing some decentralization of, of hardware production. Uh, we've got amazing countering uh, narratives now to the uh, the ESG stuff and the uh, you know Bitcoin uses too much energy. It's just really piling up. Um, fantastic content analysis research coming out, documentaries coming out. We're going to see uh, a documentary launch here in about ten days or so that Swan is helping to uh, to present and produce um, about Bitcoin's energy usage. That's particularly directed, you know, at uh, people with environmental concerns about Bitcoin and. We've already like actually seen that particular film turn around people who are working on it to help produce the film uh, technically who had been, you know, staying away from Bitcoin because of those environmental concerns and working on the film just turned them around completely. And now they're stacking. Um, so, you know, with content like this, we'll be able to, I think, help guide understanding uh, among politicians and corporations and the media 
uh, when they talk about these ideas that, hey, there's there's other you know, there's a counter narrative. You know, th there's, you know, facts that are coming out and being presented in more accessible and more professional ways. Uh, so I, I think it's super bullish. Absolutely. Brady, bullish. Brady, you're saying that Swan is uh, is contracting uh, projects that actually involve normies. Non-hardcore <laughs> Bitcoiners, I'm shocked. Yeah, shocked. I, on, I mean, you know, we we're not directly involved in the production process, uh, but you know, we're we're helping in other ways. So, yeah. It, but yes, there were some normies involved in the project. Uh, but our our direct hiring policy uh, remains the same. We we hire off of Bitcoin Twitter. So that's uh, that's your resume. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, what else? Um, this is an interesting tweet that uh, came in request for topics. And by the way, in the chat, please uh, give us some feedback and throw questions in there for uh, Preston and Andy. Uh, you know, this show is much more like chat friendly uh, than some of the other uh, shows, or, you know, episodes we do on Swan Signal Live. So let's uh, let's get you all involved and, and have some fun there. Um, there was a, a response to one of your tweets. Um, it was interesting. So it was a kind of a picture, a quote from uh, excerpt from When Money Dies. And um, it talks about inflation and deflation profiteering. And I wondered if uh, Preston would, would be willing to kind of unpack this and Andy comment on it as well. Um, so the idea here is that, here's the quote, inflation profiteering had consisted of borrowing paper marks, speaking of uh, the German uh, currency, converting them into goods and factories, and then repaying the lenders with depreciated paper. It was a process of which both, um, I can skip that sentence, deflation profiteering, however, whose possibilities uh, were realized by others, consisted of selling everything available for the new stable marks, and in this period of the tightest imaginable credit, lending the proceeds at extravagant rates of interest. And the, the comment here uh, from Bitcoin Architect, who posted this question and reply was, uh, interestingly, Bitcoin with increasing ease allows for both inflation and deflation profiteering. Um, yeah, I wondered if you wanted to unpack that and, and describe uh, what you think Bitcoin Architect was getting at here. So I think uh, in terms that anybody can understand, if you own a house today and you're 90% leveraged on the house and you only have 10% down, um, and let's say that you could have put 20% down on the house and we'll just use like really simple numbers here. Let's say um, you put 10% down and I'm using a million dollar house just because it's easier on the numbers, but let's say you put 10% down on a million dollar house. Um, so you coughed up a hundred thousand, you put it down, but let's say you had $200,000 at your disposal. So you could take that extra hundred thousand dollars and instead of putting it towards the equity of the house, you could mm -hmm. take that buy Bitcoin with it. Um, and now you're in this situation where you're, you're highly levered in the house, you're 90% levered in the house, but yeah. that 10% Bitcoin or that hundred thousand dollars that you put into Bitcoin, let's say that that's worth uh, two Bitcoin. Let's say we go through a four year period of time and, you know, most of our expectations that we're, we're going to be some, at some pretty high numbers in four years from now on the valuation of Bitcoin. So that person's slowly paying back that for the, the, the terms of your loan is that you will deliver in a in a fixed rate terms fiat currency back to the lender right it doesn't specify that they can change the denomination of the currency or the money that's being used to repay the loan so it's it's a fixed rate in dollars or euros or whatever you're from in fiat terms and so a person who's taking advantage and owning the new money or the new currency so going back to the Weimar Republic you start getting into like the 1922, 1923 timeframe, the businesses were doing all their, all their uh, unit of account in foreign currency at that point. Once you got into like late, I think it was like late 1922 into 1923, not any of them were using the mark for any of their unit of, of account within their business. And there was a, this is the reason why. So they would be in highly incentivized if you go back into the 1920s to borrow money or to borrow marks, right? In order, especially if they're in fixed rate terms, not if they're in variable terms, but if they're in fixed rate terms and you're and you're borrowing those, because you're gonna pay that loan back that's it, that's that's like almost like frozen in time at these rates that were really easy to repay six months later yeah. because the money had had exploded. So that's what they're really getting at. I'm not uh presenting the scenario that I described with with mortgages 
to encourage people to put themselves in a situation where they're highly levered, especially if they don't have a skill set that will be um, easily maintained or you'll continue to have a flow of labor going through maybe a really difficult economic turmoil type event. Um, so I think it's a, it's a case by case situation where people really have to know understand um, quite a few things here. One of the most important things is like what's your net worth. So like if you have a ten million dollar net worth and you lever a million dollar house ninety percent, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, but if you if your net worth is the two hundred thousand dollars I'm describing and you're levering this entire monstrous house and maybe your skill set is something that would become impaired through an economic downturn. Well, now there's, you're probably taking on quite a bit of risk. And if you've got a family, those are really turning into really poor decisions um, because you don't necessarily know for sure that any of this is going to play out the way that we're describing. So I'm just trying to, to frame it in a way people can understand. I don't want to give people bad ideas, but I also want people to maybe take advantage of some of the, the, the ways that they can lever a a really strange situation that that I think we're probably on the cusp of experiencing here in the next five years. That's good stuff. Um, I want to make a couple comments. One with respect to you know like Weimar Germany and hyperinflation. The dynamics in that kind of a situation are not the same as what we're experiencing now. I don't think, or even likely to experience, let's say, in the next few years. Um, one of the lessons of hyperinflation's you know, which I think is what the the reading is getting at, the book is getting at is, um, you know, the 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 value of the currency can be going to zero sort of exponentially, but within that time period, which happens over years, you get reversals, right? This is why during that same period, uh, if you held gold, you did really well, but if you levered your gold, you got wrecked. <laughs> right. In other words, you get you get time periods where the central bank, you know, reverses itself or government makes some move. They impose some, you know, new tariff or new restriction or, you know, limits on who can hold what assets. And so you get yes, it's a clear path, but you get sort of reversals on the way that can that can surprise you. So that's one piece to consider. And then with respect to, you know, debt and leverage. I agree with Preston. Um, mortgage debt in general is great. That's like the good kind of leverage, right? Mm -hmm. Two thumbs up for mortgage debt because <laughs> it has, because as long as you can make your mortgage payment, right? As long as you can pay your interest in your principal, uh, you're fine. Um, two thumbs down in my book for most kinds of debt in the Bitcoin space, which is basically margin debt, which is where if you get mark to market, for just an instant, you know, and, and you get margin called and you get liquidated, well, then uh, then you're out of the game. And um, just to agree with um, something Preston said earlier, you know, I said earlier that I don't expect a 90% downturn in the price of Bitcoin. Um, but that's not a 100% statement. That doesn't mean it can't happen. And so, you know, I know plenty of people who are plan if they haven't already, they're planning on saying, Oh, I'm only going to lever my stack. You know, I'm going to borrow 20% loan to value or 15% loan to value. And I'm safe because the price isn't going to go down 85% again. And to that, I say, I think you're crazy, to be honest. Um, I guess if you can sort of, in my opinion, you'd be better off hiving off, you know, whatever, 10 or 20% of your stack and pledging that as collateral at a higher loan to value rate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then assuming that you might lose it rather than pledging you know most or all of your stack even at a loan low loan to value rate because there's still that smallish yeah. probability that you still get liquidated because the price for a you know split second does go down to that level and um that just that scares me they'll love to get you with those wicks hunting hunting those liquidations uh, yeah, so you got to be careful with that. We got a, so we got a couple of questions coming in. Um, this was also on Twitter, uh, a similar question about special drawing rights. And the IMF recently uh, printed some, what, $600 million worth or something like that. That, that seems pedestrian to me at this point. But um, so 
what are first of all what are special drawing rights and the question here in the from roman in the chat was uh, how do they print sdrs if they're based on a basket do governments provide them with fiat to back it or is it just inflation on top of the already inflating reserve currencies what's well, fractional reserved at the sdr <laughs> then right like yeah. That's how they're doing it. So maybe one SDR used to equal $1, one euro and one yen. And then if they if they turn it into two SDRs and it's still equal to $1, one euro, one yen, they just fractional reserve their, they basically did a, uh, just like a company can issue more stock. That's what they're doing with their SDR. Um, mm -hmm. The SDR, in, in my opinion, the SDR is just a total joke. Like this whole narrative that the SDR could somehow like peg the global currencies is just so like not even worth my breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's, it is, it's such a joke. It's right? fiat on top of fiat, right? Yeah. It's, right. It's a fiat derivative on top of a basket of fiat money. And, and getting to the question, which is like, oh, are the, are the fiat, money that underlie the SDR, you know, do they exist or were they printed? I mean, the answer is, you know, the, the Fed can, or any other central bank can, out of thin air, as you know, create as many, you know, as many uh, shroot bucks to put into that <laughs> SDR <laughs> basket as they feel like. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 yeah, trying to, we're tr it, it does make me laugh too. I mean, it's, it's yeah, you, all I mean, it's how could you possibly money. have control? How could you possibly peg something to, you know, uh, something that everyone else has or several other governments have control of. In terms Meanwhile, of like the, the main, the, like the G7, the ones that are really kind of supplying like the, the main currencies that make up the, the basket. Do you really think they're going to let uh, a few of these like world political leaders um, force a peg upon them at this point? I mean, it's just totally laughable. Like there's just no way. And um, even if they did try to do that, you're going to get into this situation where you're going to create this massive economic event. Let's just, let's just pull the thread and let's just say that they, uh, the IMF sits down each one of the central bankers, like you are not going to debase your currencies anymore. And we are going to peg them because this insanity has to stop. Right mm -hmm. now, all you go back to your countries and execute that plan, right? They, it'll last. It, I mean, look at the debasement that we're seeing right now on the on the money supply growth for each country. Like, it's it's still going crazy. Like, it's never stopped, even from the COVID numbers. Like, it shot up and they they eased off a touch, but they're still debasing. Mm -hmm. So, um, for them to stop that, like, the markets just totally get slammed, and they're like they're they're not going to be able to handle it, especially with all the supply chain impacts, like we were talking about earlier. Like, it's there's no way. So then what are they going to do? They're going to go back to the to the people at the IMF and say, well, we're doing it and everything's falling apart and we just got to keep doing it and and somehow we'll manage the No, it's it's fantasy land, right? Like it's not even it's such a waste of uh consideration in my in my opinion. I mean, they're just grasping at straws here at this point. It's just yeah, it's just anything to try to trick people into some confidence, I guess. Um, That's right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, put some right. other strange, complicated illusion on the uh, on the projection screen. Uh, yep. Get the uh, you know get the dog to to chase that new car over there. It uh, it's like it feels like it's just misdirection, right? Yep, absolutely. That's what it definitely feels like to me. Um, another good question, a couple questions, um, and I feel like they're both related, so we can kind of put this into a little section of discussion here. There's one people asking about in on the Twitter thread about um, adoption by corporations. So of course we had, you know, we've had a few, and and then adoption by countries. We've had, you know, El Salvador create it as a, a legal tender. Uh, that's going into effect on September seventh. Um, and it's going to be really fascinating to watch that experiment. So I kind of see these as sort of the early adopters on the very beginning of the S curve for these two types of entities uh, adopting Bitcoin. So we'd just like to hear your guys' comments. People are kind of wondering, like, you know, why haven't we seen more of this? Uh, and in, the, in regards to countries adopting it, since it's still relatively recent, and it's been already a whole year and a half since MicroStrategy started this, why aren't we seeing the entire S&P 500 doing this yet? 
um, you know, what other countries do you think um, might be ripe for this, for this kind of adoption? Uh, Salvador like countries, but, um, you know, if you have any speculation on which particular countries or whatever, you can just talk about types of countries and how it might be adopted. So, so let's start with corporations. Can I, so, so I just want to jump into one of the questions on corporations, which is, you know, why, yeah. why hasn't everyone and their mother, uh, why hasn't the entire S and P, uh, followed Michael Saylor yet? Yeah. And my answer <laughs> right. to that, uh, my answer to that is, you know, the, the liquidation we saw a few months ago. Um, uh -huh. that's my best yeah. guess. Um, it was always going to take some time and sailor laid out the playbook. You know, it was like six to nine months process of, Oh, you got to get, you got to learn about it yourself. I'm talking about management. You got to get the board, you know, to learn about it and, and be on board. You got to figure out your custody. You got to figure out the accounting, you got to figure out the legal, right? All these steps. And that all takes time. And so the, arguably the best case scenario was even after, you know, Sailor had the, I can't remember when the conference was where he, you know, specifically laid out the playbook to, uh, to management teams. Even that I think was this year, right? Was that like January or February? So even yeah. if, you know, even generously speaking, a very diligent, you know, Bitcoiner CEO or CFO at some company, even if they were paying a lot of attention late last year to what Sailor was doing, i.e. If, even if they were front running that conference where he laid out the playbook, it still was going to take, you know, half a year or three quarters of a year at least. Now, what I imagine, and I can't substantiate this uh, with any proof, but what, what I imagine is there was some number of decent sized companies that were actually taking a hard look at this. Yeah. And then the, the, the recent liquidation happened and they probably decided to uh, take the summer off, <laughs> so to <laughs> yeah. speak, from the Bitcoin, yeah. uh, you know, from the from the Bitcoin Treasury uh, agenda Project. item. That yeah. that agenda <laughs> item may have may have fallen a little bit lower on the uh, on the board agenda, you know, priorities. So yeah. anyway, that's my guess as to why we haven't seen more uh, at this point where we are in August 2021. Makes sense. Uh, I would say that when you go back a year, um, once we pass through the previous all time high, there was quite a buzz and a, quite a bit of shock for people who maybe were watching the space uh, previously. And um, I think that alone had kind of pushed some of them over the edge and saying, all right, we've got to own some of this. This is obviously something that is not tulips, like I've been told, um, right. because they just don't seem to die. And um, so when when you had it running, you had the big hoopla, you had the Teslas, you had them making their announcements and then them not making announcements and then the getting confused as to what the technology even was and lots of confusion. And um, so then you go through that and you go through that sell off. And now I think you're getting the curiosity back. I think if we would make a new high um, again, I think a lot of those corporate announcements then start coming out. Another big piece that I think is important for people to consider is when you're talking about uh, publicly traded companies, especially large ones, you're talking about rent rented CEOs and not founders that created the company. And there's a massive difference in the way that these types of people think, the way that mm -hmm. these people operate, and the way that they're incentivized to, uh, to operate and act. So let me give you an example. If you got a private company and you got a founder who owns a majority of the voting rights or a significant portion of the voting rights, they can go out there and just make bold calls, especially if it's a profitable company, right. they can go out there and do bold things. That's what you're seeing with, with Michael Saylor, but as a publicly traded company, he has a majority of the voting rights through preferred type stock that allows him to go out there and do really bold things. Of course, the board's got to kind of go along with it. But if you don't think that he has a lot more influence on that board than, uh, than a normal CEO slash founder, you're absolutely kidding yourself. Um, when you look at most of these publicly traded companies, they, the CEOs are highly incentivized to almost act like a political uh, figure in politics. They want to keep the job because it pays them very handsomely. They uh, want to play nice with the board. They don't want to spook the board by doing anything that would be viewed optically as being kind of out there or non-standard. If anything, they're incentivized to kind of fit in and not do anything that like rocks the boat. Um, they play nice with the board. The board, the, the people sitting on the board of a lot of these companies are the ex exact same way. 
they want to collect their 250, probably $500,000 check by going to their four meetings every year, maybe a little bit more. Um, they don't want to get kicked off that board because it's, uh, you, you know, it's something that they can list on their LinkedIn account and all these other things. So, uh, that's kind of the dynamic that you're up against with a lot of companies is because this is how they are being governed. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit different than what maybe people think when they're looking at like a Michael Saylor, who's going out there and saying whatever the hell he wants, because guess what? He was smart enough to be able to retain the voting rights of his company um, to be able to go out and make bold calls and, and do what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a massive difference. Uh, and you know, with like hedge funds too, or that are trying to invest in these big funds, uh, you know, they have, you know, rules, uh, you know, in their bylaws that say we can only hold, you know, once, once an asset grows to X percent or increases X amount, you know, you've got to sell it off to rebalance and, and that kind of thing. So, um, that's going to happen. These, these aren't going to be like tight fisted hodlers who are going to hold forever. We're going to hold forever. Um, so what about uh, countries, El Salvador, thoughts on El Salvador? How do you think this thing's going to roll out? Um, you know, if this thing is a total bust and just a clusterfuck, like, is it going to, uh, you know, be bad for Bitcoin or bad for a you know, nation state adoption of Bitcoin? Um, if it goes great, you know, what are we going to see? Like, um, what, what, you know, what, <laughs> this is good for Bitcoin in any case, but let's kind of play out both scenarios and, and think about how this thing would, would affect Bitcoin in the world i think it's uh bullish i think their timing is impeccable uh for the rollout um i love yeah. the fact that the that the country still is allowing the participants to choose whether they want to use the dollar or they want to use bitcoin it's totally up to them how they want to sweep their their savings um, i think that's a really important uh point for anybody that's participating in this your expenses, your fixed expenses, your variable expenses are denominated in fiat dollars today. There's no getting around that. So for somebody who maybe doesn't have an enormous amount of free cash flow in their in their monthly expenses, let's say it's really small. Like, I'm sorry, but the, all the more that you can stack each month is that free cash flow. Everything else probably needs their, to be retained in the fiat currency so you can meet your your obligations and your debts and liabilities um this goes for companies this goes for individuals and so down in el salvador they're rolling this out i think at a very strategic point in time they're able to allow their citizens to start experimenting with this their citizens can start putting a small portion of their savings into it i think everybody's getting some portion of of bitcoin in a in a wallet 30 and bucks, yeah. yeah and i mean they're gonna watch that and they're probably going to watch it double, triple in in short order, in my opinion. And um, it's gonna it's gonna make their eyebrow go up, and they're gonna say, "So what the heck is this?" Mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> let me do some more research. And and make no mistake about it, the way people actually get conviction in Bitcoin is by a having some position, any size, and then that's what induces them to learn more. And the more mm -hmm. that you learn and the more that you study, the harder it is to look somewhere else. So I'm excited about it. I think this is this is going to be huge for the country, and I think it's going to be huge for the world. I agree completely. Yeah. My favorite thing about the El Salvador story is it's a bit of an under, underdog story, right? I mean, the classic thing that people say about Bitcoin is, you know, wealthy Westerners, countries, you know, people who live in countries where the money has more or less you know, functioned during our lifetime, relatively speaking, have trouble getting Bitcoin. And this is a chance for, you know, people and countries that have had a harder time of it, either because they're excluded from the existing monetary system, as is the case for, you know, God knows how many, you know, millions of people in El Salvador. Um, you know, it's just, I think it's a small percentage that have bank accounts and it's, I don't know, 5 million people or something total in the country. So it is millions of people. Um, they get a shot to get on this ladder a little bit sooner than uh, than most of the rest of the world, and uh, that's a great story. I mean, talk about talk about positive narrative, right? Um, and the way that the incentives are aligned is it's likely to be other. If you talk about like who's next, right? Which country is next? 
I do think it's likely to be other similar countries. It's going to be countries that are small, that are marginalized from the world, you know, fin financial and trade system. Um, it's going to be countries that are, you know, that have populations that are underbanked or unbanked. Um, yeah, it, and it's, you know, obviously it's going to be countries that are led by, uh, let's say, I was going to say younger, but at least more visionary uh, leaders, uh, let's say, as as is the case with um, with El Salvador and Bukele. Now, I do have some concerns uh, about the execution. Um, you know, I'm really, I'm crossing my fingers and I'm hoping basically that they don't screw it up. Uh, it would be not great if they, if they screw it up, but I am definitely cautiously optimistic and this is a chance for them to shine as a country it's a chance for bitcoin to shine and um yeah it it opens up a huge opportunity for uh for the rest of the world and it's just bullish incredibly bullish for the lightning network uh and that's amazing and wonderful to see um and just real quick, I mean, Lightning Network has been going parabolic uh, the past few months in terms of the infrastructure, the number of nodes, the amount of Bitcoin in the network. Um, and it's, a, it's incredible to see. There's um, a, a new, uh, well, obviously Sphinx Chat and like the value for value model uh, is, is really kind of gaining some steam. There's a new project called Zion, which is really fascinating. There's some really heavy hitters uh, behind that project. Um, including Joe Rogan and Tony Robbins and some other big names of uh, in the content production world. And it's going to be basically a social media network that's uncensorable and uh, built on the Lightning Network. Um, you know, if you want to join the network, you get a node I and mean, you have to have a node, right? So um, there's a company called Voltage. It's actually based uh, nearby uh, and they provide uh, Lightning nodes in the cloud and Zion's going to work with Voltage and you know, they're going to let people in 500 or a thousand at a time. And every single one of those people who joins the network to use it is and read social media from these, you know, from big publishers like these who want to create uncensorable uh, platforms, then, uh, you know, it's a new node on the network and more Bitcoin that gets out of the network. So I, it's, it's finding its stride and its use cases and the UX is there and it feels like it's, hitting, as Marty Bent said in his newsletter last week or this week some, at some point, you know, it feels like the Lightning Network is hitting its suddenly moment. Uh, any any thoughts about Lightning and where we are? I mean, the, the growth of it's just explosive. So I'm there with Marty. Um, I think the, the, the big difference that you're seeing now is that now there's an incentive to start using it because of the fee reduction and not having to settle on chain. Um, you're, I just look at Fold, for example. So Fold's doing all these transactions all day long with people that are swiping their, their Visa card. They're getting uh, Bitcoin rewards. And they don't want to have to pay a fee to take physical custody of that. Fold doesn't want to have to take, you know, do all these on-chain transactions. You're going to yep. start seeing it with exchanges too, especially for people that are buying $100 worth and they want to send it to their own private wallet. I think a lot of these, uh, the Venmos, the the Robin Hoods, like all of them are going to have to allow people to take custody of their coins or they're going to lose business to people like Swan. Um, that, that that's like a core priority for the customer base so that they can immediately withdraw their funds. And so I think exchanges and everybody's going to have this incentive to, to operate on lightning because everybody's going to demand a reduction in fees and they don't mind collecting, you know, lightning Bitcoin. There's Absolutely. a big there's a big de-risking element I think from the investment side here which didn't exist a couple years ago. When it comes to uh, people deciding to take a position personally in Bitcoin or deciding how much of their net worth, you know, how much of their savings are going to plug plunk into Bitcoin, you know, the the digital gold narrative has always been strong. Um, and there was there was always the argument that the second and third layer would be built and would be adopted, you know, whether it was lightning or something else. And, but there is a difference between uh, it's going to happen and it's actually happening and <laughs> it's actually yeah. happening now. It so, is. so, so that argument that, Oh, Bitcoin can't scale or it's speculative that Bitcoin will be able to scale should be dead. Now um, 
I think that, uh, yeah, this is one more yes. barrier to adoption or to the logic of the idea getting to one of these chat questions, you know, of what's the total addressable market for Bitcoin. <laughs> well, if Bitcoin can scale, which is evident from what's going on with Lightning, then that TAM truly is enormous, you know, hundreds of trillions, um, big, big numbers. And, and it's an important point, too, that the user interface for these wallets yeah. being able to loop from on chain to layer two is becoming seamless to the user. And that that needs to take place before you're going to have people kind of willing to accept a lot of the, the lightning transactions so that it's just seamless to them, even though all these really amazing cryptographic things are happening in the background. So that's yep. we're seeing that now, which even a year ago, I don't necessarily remember um, the, the blue wallet or anything like that, having that type of capability with the user interface being so strong. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, liquidity maintenance stuff that was that, manual yeah. for a long time, all that. Yeah. It's the UX is there now. Uh, another project that I just got to give a shout out to is impervious and, uh, they did a hackathon recently and just had some incredible, uh, projects, uh, ideas just emerge, uh, over a weekend, uh, with their, they're, they're building basically a development stack on top of lightning. So they're developer tools, you know, and, uh, you know, this has always been the narrative around Ethereum is that Ethereum is more developer friendly. You know, it's basically any JavaScript engineer can come in and build uh, smart contracts in Ethereum, um, which, you know, uh, it tends to be extremely un insecure. But we're building similarly um, usable, you know, by a broader, broader range of developers, um, stacks, uh, developer stacks and tools that are much more secure. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's that kind of like, slow growth, uh, focus on security, focus on, uh, you know, the de decentralization first I idea is working and it's like the, the tortoise beats the hare and it's move fast, break things mentality versus the let's do this thing right because we're building for 500 years kind of mentality. And, uh, you know, for, for that, like if you take that into consideration, the fact that we're only quote unquote, three years behind in terms of uh, developing, you know, this kind of easy, easier to use developer tools, uh, then, you know, like, I don't think we're, we're uh, doing that badly. Um, so we're going to see amazing things on Lightning over the next couple of years. And it's going to blow everybody away. Yeah. So Brady, are, uh, I, I saw it on the Twitter feed earlier. Are we going to, are we going to talk about the ETF? Yeah, that's on here. I've got, I mean, I've got several things uh, on here that we could get into still. Um, I've got a hypothesis. Of, I got a hypothesis about the ETF that I want to offer. Let's hear and, um, and, you know, let's hear this. Guys, what you guys think. So a lot of people, myself included, are scratching their heads about the noise coming out of Gensler and the SEC about how a futures based ETF might be a better idea than a you know a cash coin base. Oh ETF. yeah, it's better. It's better. And I was <laughs> I was think, I was trying to think about you know why like why does Gensler why would yeah. Gensler rather have this? What's his incentive? What's his incentive? And here's my thoughts. So he gave this speech at the Aspen Institute a few weeks ago, right? And um, he kind of came out guns blazing. He said a lot of things. One of the things he said, I think more than once, was that. If you are an exchange operator, and he meant in the U.S., and you've got a bunch of assets listed, right? Let's say 30, 30 assets, 30 crypto assets, okay, in quotation marks. What are the odds that none of those are securities? And his implication is that, you know, all these guys should be registered as exchanges with the SEC. Mm-hmm. And then I thought to myself, okay, that's interesting. And then I thought to myself, um, you know, what is the status of market surveillance? Because there was this this letter that was issued, um, I think it was Dahlia Blass in January of 18, where they laid out a bunch of issues, sort of outstanding issues, you know, for, um, for what's required basically, um, you know, for an ETF. And it was all about, you know, liquidity and market surveillance and custody and all this stuff. And the thing that occurred to me is futures, as they exist in the U.S., are traded on two registered exchanges. I'm talking about the CME and the SIBO. 
they're not SEC registered, but they are CFTC registered. And to my knowledge, none of the exchanges, correct me if I'm wrong, um, guys, you may know this, but to my knowledge, none of the crypto exchanges in the U.S. are registered with either the SEC or the CFTC, right? They're claiming to be money transmitters. And I think this may be sort of a sly way by Gensler to say, look, uh, I'm going to reward the instrument that trades in the U.S. on a registered exchange, which today is the is the futures. And granted, there's plenty of futures that are trading on very not registered exchanges. You know, I'm thinking of like, you know, Binance and BitMEX, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, but but it's an interesting way of rewarding, you know, from his perspective, like I said, and maybe implying that, hey, guys, if you're trading cash, like outright coins, right? If you're trading coins in the US, um, you know, I'm not going to basically reward the industry potentially with an ETF unless and until those markets that are trading those cash coins, which would underline a cash based you know, or coin-based ETF are registered uh, properly. Just a thought. Yeah, I think you're, it seems like all all narratives uh, around Ginsler go back to him trying to classify Bitcoin as a commodity and everything else as a security. Um, so what you just described kind of fits into that. And so, yeah, I, I could totally buy what you're saying, Andy. Um, and yeah. I think I think Ginsler is a, a Bitcoiner. I do too. I do too. <laughs> it's also it's also been really fun to uh, to watch. You know, a little bit of turf war going on with the regulators, right? There was there was yeah. I don't know. Gensler tweeted something, and then Brian Quintens, you know, the CFTC was like, just for the record, you know, we're in charge of the uh, we're in charge of the commodities, not the SEC. You know, back yeah. off, buddy. And of course, the other thing about Gensler's speech was he. He didn't uh, neglect to mention that he really could use a hell of a lot more funding, right? I think he was talking about you know doubling or tripling uh, his budget. So regulators going to regulate. Uh, they <laughs> always want to grab more turf, and uh, yeah, this is his opportunity to uh, to expand expand the SEC's empire. Uh, yeah, potentially we'll see at the expense of the CFTC. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. And it's kind of a reminder of the just the ridiculousness of the whole thing, which is like, wait. The CFTC, you know, is separate and competing with the SEC, right? Like, what? What's the point of this? Like, wh why isn't it one agency that's you know sort of seamlessly, uh, you know, regulating? I'm saying seamlessly in quotation marks, regulating our our financial markets. It's uh, it's a bit of a silly situation. Yeah, I think that uh, Ginsler has way more influence in Washington than anybody has an appreciation for. Um, I think that the reason why he has so much influence is because there's probably nobody in all of Washington that understands Bitcoin specifically or any of these uh, underlying technologies better than him. And so when he's providing guidance and saying, no, I don't, I disagree with that. I think this is a commodity. I think this is an asset. Here's the reasons why. And then he can get into these really deep conversations with people and go straight over their head. I think what, how they're viewing it then is they're saying, all right, like, this guy clearly knows what he's talking about. I'm just going to outsource whatever opinion I've got to what he's recommending. And um, I think as we continue to move forward, specifically with the buyer bill, I think he is working hand in hand with the treasury and um, representative buyer in order to draft the language that's being used um, in that draft bill, which I, I've, I know I've posted it on my Twitter account. Uh, if people want to search for it, you can actually read this, this draft. I think it's around like 56, 58 pages long. You can get a real good sense as to where they're trying to go with all this. And, um, it's all right there. All you got to be do is willing to slog through, uh, pages and pages of, uh, of legalese, right? Uh, right. Preston? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, the very first thing in, in the document is defining a uh, digital asset versus a digital asset security. And I think when people look at that, they're going to see that it's it's kind of a play where Bitcoin is this digital asset and then pretty much everything else is a digital asset security. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. 
And Brady, are you, are you still hosting this, or should Andy and I keep going here? You guys keep going. I was I was just trying I was just gonna try and decide what to what to go with next. Um, sometimes you know I like to leave those little awkward silences and see what happens. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I mean, you know, we're, we're at like an hour fifteen here, which is great. It's kind of what we target. But you guys want to do one or two more? Yeah. Hey, man, I'm I'm game. I don't got anything do going right. on. All right. Sweet. Um, all right, so Starberry asked in the chat, um, Preston, what do you think about holding mining stocks in addition to holding Bitcoin, especially in context of dollar debasing as well as potential dividends paid in BTC? Uh, people aren't going to like my response. So, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, holding mining stocks. I think that a couple factors to consider. Well, I guess one consideration is like, what's your goal, right? The The answer to this for most people is uh, I'm bullish Bitcoin, but I'm greedy. So I want leverage on it, <laughs> right? I want to make more money than I'm going to make on just being long Bitcoin, or I want to make money faster. Okay. Um, you know, then the consideration is what's the market structure around these things, such as, you know, if people are willing to... Not that this is a, I don't mean to, you know, this is a dig or anything against MicroStrategy, but like given the amount of demand for MicroStrategy, you know, debt securities and other securities, what is what is that telling you? It's telling you that there's some portion of the market, probably institutional investors including included, that haven't yet figured out how to just hold Bitcoin. And so they're buying, you know, these other proxies. And that's kind of excess demand. I mean, that's kind of artificial. And so in future, when every or most institutions are set up to just hold BTC, you know, some amount of that bid for other Bitcoin substitutes or proxies is probably gonna gonna fade away. So structurally, that's you know, that's a bad setup, let's say, for miners relative to just holding BTC. Um you know, the second question is, you know, are you going to hold them for the long run? You know, is are you just looking at it as a trade? If you're looking at it as a trade, you know, with taxable money, you know, then you got to you got to buy and sell at the right times. Um, there's huge volatility. There's all these other, you know, risks with respect to uh, timing of these things. Um, and it's also it is a different thing. I mean, it's like in some degrees, it's the similar to the difference between holding gold and holding gold mining companies uh you know there's a bunch of other factors you know how the hash rate is going to play out you know what what generations of new asics are coming online you know are these companies basically going to be set up to uh, have the right uh technical stack asset access to the asics you know plus the ability to install them plus you know the best sites plus the lowest power i mean it's a it's a whole other layer of complexity so suffice to say, like, do I hold Bitcoin mining stocks? No. Am I excited about holding them? Not really. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Uh, same answer. Yeah, my same there you answer. Go. The, the chat, the, the chat demands Preston's answer, but I think Andy so. Just well, gave so it. so if I was going to get more specific, so it goes back to something that I said earlier, which is what's the discount rate that we're using here? So I'm a value investor. Um, believe it or not. Um, I'm a value investor <laughs> no. and, and, uh, when I'm looking at this, I'm just doing a valuation on it. So I'm looking at the free cash flows. This is a company. And when I'm looking at the free cash flows, I'm looking at them denominated in Bitcoin the, that they're retaining and, um, comparing that to the market price that I can buy the stock for, because that's a, that, that is a known variable as, as much as your business school will try to treat that like it's an unknown variable. I promise you it's a known variable. You just got to look up the stock ticker and it'll tell you what it is. Um, and so when I'm doing that and I'm looking at what the, uh, what the valuations are on these companies, the, the, the numbers are crazy. Like you're getting it, uh, like a, an IRR of, uh, under 5%, right? And, and most of the thing that's driving that it's not a it's not a fault of the miners that their that their premium is so high it's just across the market in general equity prices are priced at a, at an IRR of like three percent to two percent on the s p 500 today so when the IRRs are are that low um I don't want to own it I see the operational risks I see all these other things 
Um, I'm looking at a debasement rate of the M2 money supply of 10 to 15 percent today. So if those are the if those are the rates of debasement that Bitcoin's just going to naturally at a at a bare minimum perform at, in my opinion, looking at it on a very long term horizon, um, owning a mining stock is overpriced. Um, so until those until those PE ratios on mining stocks get down into uh, something that's giving me a, a big fat juicy return mm -hmm. in free cash flows denominated in Bitcoin, uh, I'm just not a buyer, and I'm going to continue to sit on the sidelines. And eventually, the whole the whole entire equity market is going to get repriced whenever uh, lending rates completely get repriced and interest rates go higher. And then I'm going to be there with all these, you know. Uh, coupons that are probably being kicked off at that point in time. And I'll use those to buy this super cheap equity, but we're nowhere near that right now. So I, I like the companies. I like to look at them. I think they, you know, kudos to them. They're operating and doing some, some really complex things in order to really kind of get their timing right. They're acquiring hardware. They're dealing with all sorts of supply chain issues now. Um, and it's just not something that I like, keep it simple. Like you're already knocking the, you're not just hitting a home run. You're literally cranking it out of the ball stadium and you're probably hitting it over the river on the other side of the ball stadium by just doing something really simple. And you know, why, why get all fancy with it? Well said. And, uh, one more thing too, as much as we're all here for number go up, uh, remember that, uh, with actual coin, there's more you can do with, with actual coins like self custody, <laughs> right? Uh, you can't, uh, you know, you can't, um, you can't get your uh, stonks, you know, you can't get those funds out of your current just jurisdiction, where, wherever that is, you know, probably the U.S. if you're listening uh, to this podcast. True. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you know, remember why Remember why we're here. It's not just for the investment opportunity. It's for the fact that if you want to take those coins and uh, custody them in a self-custodied, uh, safe, you know, potentially bulletproof way as well as had the ability to uh move them as you see fit uh you know that's that's why you had bitcoin it's definitely definitely a value add to uh holding bitcoin over stocks for sure all right eddie in the chat shout out eddie he's uh he's here all the time appreciate you man um at what point do you think we see the vix spike but bitcoin price go up and when that happens is that the official linchpin of hyper Bitcoinization? Who wants to? So he's so what he's really asking is when hyper Bitcoinization, basically. And do you <laughs> think that do you think that that's the signal? Is that going to be the signal? I'll tell you a price point. Uh, sorry, Andy, were you going to go? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I think once you get to a price point, um, probably around a million. Uh, per Bitcoin, you're going to probably start to see Bitcoin start to wag the market instead of the other way around. Um, obviously, where we're at now, like fiat is is driving the train as far as uh, the the market uh, impact. So like what we were talking about when we first started the show and we're saying, hey, you got all these supply chain things happening. You might get like this massive amount of, of impairment that's that's inherent with a fractional reserve fiat system that has no backing. All of those things are going to continue to occur until I think you start getting beyond a price of Bitcoin that's like over a million dollars. I think anything under that, Bitcoin's still going to be uh, impacted tremendously by the fiat uh, market. Most and, and a, a key important part of all this is just your your expense denomination being in fiat. Look around today, like there ain't nothing denominated in Bitcoin for expenses. And I expect it to stay this way for quite a while. Um, you know, at least where, where we're at right now. Now, if the price just starts punching and we start getting into like a 1920s Germany kind of chart, um, it, it can move pretty fast. Like you could get in your, uh, in a situation where companies are just demanding sats or whatever that might be. And then things are going to move out pretty quickly from there if, if that scenario would play out. And I think it's going to be uh, a, diff a very difficult time in the world through a transition like that. Um, so I don't know if that really answers Eddie que Eddie's question because I think maybe he's looking for like timeline, but I would think of it more in Bitcoin market cap and price per Bitcoin uh, where you're going to start to see those transitions and you're going to see expenses starting to get denominated in, stat in sats instead of dollars. Yeah, I like that. I like that million dollar benchmark because if that's, you know, call it close to $20 trillion Bitcoin, 
one way to look at it is recent history. We saw that liquidation uh, due to COVID in March of last year, right? And what happened? Everything went down, including gold. So gold went down in that liquidation, and gold is ten trillion. And which is more volatile? Let's put it this way: which has a more static supply, gold or Bitcoin? We know the answer to that one. So which? asset even at a 10 trillion value should be more volatile you know still probably yeah. bitcoin so yeah so if bitcoin gets to 2x the size of gold which is what you're proposing preston you know then should it behave should it behave uh, well with respect to uh, yeah liquidations in the market yeah i think that's probably right and i agree like is it is that transition going to happen before then no i i kind of doubt it yeah all right, we will already, we will already have have won, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, we already yeah. have one, but like it'll be <laughs> painfully obvious. Uh, it'll be it'll be painfully obvious. That'll be the point. Uh, yeah, when it when it's when it's happened. Hyper Bitcoinization is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, all right, we've got another one from Stephen in the chat. So he's asking about thoughts on Ben Hunt's take that the biggest threats to Bitcoin are Bitcoin TM via Wall Street and the state financial panopticon, or you know, more specifically, the Bank Secrecy Act. I don't understand a word you just said. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I'll take basically, this basically, uh, you know, like Bitcoin as only like overly KYC Bitcoin or something like that. You know, that's basically oh, okay. Okay. Bitcoin used by you know, corporations and, and the financial yeah. system yeah. Uh, and, and Wall Street. And also, you know, that the state uh, then will use that uh, to basically ruin, at least for a lot of us, uh, Bitcoin's privacy and, and self, uh, uh, yeah, like fungibility, self-sovereignty. Yeah. 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 And fungibility. Yeah. That too. Ben has, look, I have uh, mixed feelings about, you know, Ben's takes on, on Bitcoin over the years. He was very kind. He he bought me dinner because he had like some gathering in LA, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I got to meet him and I liked him. Um, but yeah, he, he has until recently, you know, been sort of reluctant to I think come out very strongly in, in favor of Bitcoin, which is sort of ironic given his view of the world and uh you know, and what's what's going on with uh government and society and, and sort of how we write the ship. Um Okay, so a couple things. One is he's dead on that government really, I'm talking about the U.S. government, really, really wants to know where all the money is, literally. And that's why he call, talks about like the Eye of Sauron, right? And, you know, literally the Treasury specifically wanting to see every dollar and therefore every other type of money. And we saw that, you know, we saw that monster, uh, bear its teeth just recently with the with the fact that it came to light that oh it was treasury right that had drafted this language uh that was include, included in the infrastructure bill and they're the ones who are trying to overreach and say oh yeah you know we're not gonna whatever prosecute i don't know miners or developers or others who get caught in this definition of a broker you know because that's not what we really want to do and yet they're hitting us with that language or trying to you know, basically because they want to see where everything moves. I do think that's their motivation. Now, is that a threat to Bitcoin? Um, I don't know. I sort of take the view that, and this is pretty unpopular, I think, with, with a lot of other Bitcoiners, that I'm actually in less of a hurry to get privacy on Bitcoin. I want Bitcoin, I want it to happen eventually, but I want Bitcoin to get so big and strong first um, that, you know, there's just no risk of, I don't know, government backlash uh, or, or threat from the powers that be. I want that to, I want Bitcoin to get really huge first. Um, and so, yeah, if the treasury can kind of surveil most of the stuff that's going on, you know, for a while, and if the chain analysis companies can, you know, have at it, um, I'm actually okay with that for you know some period of time while Bitcoin just gets bigger and bigger and impossible to kill. So that's one thing. 
With respect to Bitcoin, quote unquote, Bitcoin TM, what he's talking about is, yeah, the financialization and Wall Street. Wall Streetification, yeah, <laughs> not yeah. a word, but uh, there's 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 a term should, should be, <laughs> and yeah, and and there there's some concern about this. One of one of the one of which is you know creating fractional reserve and basically issuing tons of derivatives, you know, issuing um, a lot of paper claims against Bitcoin, which could in the short term suppress price, you know, kind of like you've got, you know, the futures market uh, suppressing price in, in precious metals, as has been the case, it's believed for, for years. Um, so that's a concern. And I think you could, you could get an argument. Um, I think Caitlin Long has probably argued something similar, which is like, look, if there's a ton of leverage that comes into the system, including into the banking system, you know, this, I used to be really excited about, you know, the guidance that came from uh, Brian Brooks when he was controller of the currency. And he basically said, look, good news. Banks can hold Bitcoin. At first, I was like, oh, this is great. Um, and then I thought more about it. And I thought it's good. But on the other hand, it does actually link and expose the banking system to what happens in Bitcoin. And even though that's even though Bitcoin's too small right now and it's sort of immaterial, you know, compared to the broader financial system, it gives regulators and legislators, you know, an excuse basically to talk about how, you know, oh, this this whole crypto world, this crypto thing could be, a, you know, a threat to, quote unquote, financial stability, which we know is supremely ironic, right? Because it's the <laughs> it's the fractional reserve system that is a threat to financial stability. But, right. <laughs> you know, it's where we are with government. So anyway, long-winded way of saying I, I'm actually less concerned about these things I think than than Ben is. I don't think they're likely to be a significant threat to Bitcoin success in the long run. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. I agree with everything Andy just said, and um, I just see it as a very negative. Uh, point of view. And and that doesn't make it a, a wrong point of view. And I, I want to emphasize that. And I think it's important for people to highlight risks and concerns as we're thinking about how this is going to progress moving forward. And because that gives all the programmers uh, way, ways to think about how they can circumnavigate whatever uh, that issue or concern might be. Um, I don't see Wall Street being in front of anything that has happened to date. Um yeah. In fact, you might argue that they've been the polar opposite of understanding this or being in front of this. Um, you know, whenever they bring their financialization of it, so like the whole cash settle derivatives piece is a is a great example where people, you know, Wall Streeters are like, oh, well, we're just gonna do cash settle derivatives and it's gonna it's gonna make you guys just pointless. And mm -hmm. um they just don't understand how the technology works. They don't know that it can be immediately settled with no cost, physically settled Im immediately. And then the storage cost is pretty much nothing. Um, so uh, when you have that and you have exchanges all over the world that are that are more than willing to open up that, that physically settled attribute, um, you just pretty much have to fail the intelligence test to do a cash settled derivatives product on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's just, that's all there is to it. There's, there's no arguing that that's just, if you're, if you're choosing to go that route, it's because you don't understand what's happening period. Yeah. Um, so wall street. Yeah. I, I don't see that as any type of concern. And, you know, Ben, Ben's Brent, Ben's a great writer and he's, uh, great at, um, highlighting problems, yeah. but, um, like most people in the world, they're very good at, at being problem identifiers, but there's very few problem solvers out there. And I think people who understand Bitcoin are problem solvers. Yeah. And my impression is that just, you know, Ben's kind of been beaten down and he's pessimistic, yeah. you know, and extremely it's, pessimistic. Yeah. There's so much, you know, uh, so much going on out there that it's easy to get bogged down there. But, um, you know, you, you just don't want to be like, oh, there can't possibly be a solution out there. It's just too much, yeah. too much for Bitcoin. It's going to lose. It's going to lose. Yeah. It's just the whole world's falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it's the reset button. Maybe. And it and part of the genius of how this is all evolved. I mean, you really wonder. I wish I could have you know, been the fly on the wall uh, in Satoshi's office as he was uh, hammering this thing out and thinking about, you know, how this how this could play out, you know, what waves of adoption would occur. And 
because it's already been 12 years plus with this thing, even if Wall Street comes in really heavy, you know, still the majority of the coins are cold stored offline, you know, whether it's OGs or, you know, various waves of individuals that have, or miners, you know, that have come to it since, you know, it's not like you're restarting the clock and the financial system slash Wall Street is going to have their hands on, you know, half the coins. They're probably not, right? It's it's still the majority of the outstanding uh, coins that are in the hands of uh, of the earlier adopters, who hopefully understand what they have. And um, yeah, so I just this thing is so widely distributed, and Wall Street is so late, as as Preston pointed out, beyond late, yeah, that. Um, that it's great. It's just great news because they're incremental. They're incremental demand, and they'll help normies learn and and onboard. But it's too late for them, I think, to you know to really leverage it to really take it over to uh, to exercise any I mean, any real control. Just look at Jamie Dimon. I mean, the guy has been just dead wrong every step of the way. I found it hilarious that when we were at like sixty sixty five k. I suspect he probably got some type of inside information that China was going to ban all their mining. Um, you saw the price uh, fall as soon as he said, oh, I'd, I, I would hate to be a person in crypto right now. And then the price went down 50%. Well, surprise, uh, Jamie, there's this thing called a difficulty adjustment. Uh, and it just naturally makes the miners profitable again. And then they, <laughs> you know, within, within two months, right? So, uh, these these they haven't done the homework. In my opinion, most have not done the homework to understand the technology. They don't understand that there's this thing called number go up technology that's built into the incentive structure. And if you think I'm joking around, I'm not joking around. It's built into the into the system in order to keep pumping this thing up to certain levels every four years. And until people figure that out, they're going to continue to be mystified as they look at a linear chart instead of a log chart. And they're going to say, well, this just can't keep going on. These are tulips. And surprise, yep. they're not tulips. Uh, pull up a log chart for once and look at this thing, and maybe it might start making sense to you. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's absolutely incredible. We had a great uh, uh, line here, and we can talk about it for a minute. Preston liked it too, uh, from Nicholas. Bitcoin will indirectly get a bailout this decade. What does he mean? Well, and, and I think... Uh, well, I don't want to say we, we've seen this yet, but think about it. If the price of Bitcoin, let's say it gets to something like a 10 trillion market cap, and we go through this impairment with fiat currency, and the price of Bitcoin drops, let's just say it drops 50%, it's going to claw $5 trillion worth of buying power out of the market. And if you don't think that pulling $5 trillion worth of buying power out of the market isn't going to have a cascading impact of impairment into other areas... You're totally kidding yourself. And so what your Wall Streeters are going to then say is, oh, my God, it was the Bitcoin uh, market crash and the central bankers had to come save the day and and replenish all the fiat units into the well, the fiat units were, were <laughs> mostly credit. Right. They weren't actually monetary baseline units in the system, but they're going to step in and they're going to replenish it with more monetary baseline. They're going to stack a whole bunch of credit on top of it all all over again. And it's going to be blamed on Bitcoin. And so I think this was mm -hmm. Stephen who had this comment. I think this is absolutely going to play out. It's just a matter of when. And be prepared for that narrative to come in. And, and what they're up against is there's other people in the world and other nation states in the world that do understand this. And um, they're going to say, oh, well, hey, thanks for pumping all those fiat units back into the system because you just pumped my bags. Thank you very much. Amen. And, then, and, yeah. and make no mistake, they've got to pump your bags. They, they got to pump them. They got to pump, pump, pump them. They have to pump them. And this gets to the earlier question about, you know, when does uh, when does Bitcoin, you know, flip from positive correlation, let's say, to, to risk assets, you know, to yeah. negative correlation? When and does you're it become, almost, yeah, yeah, you're when, getting there. When it, when does it become the safe haven? And uh, that is part of the beauty is, well, as long as other risk assets have to pump, right? As long as the plunge protection team is on the beat. Like as long as they got to save the stock market, as long as they got to save the real estate market, they're also going to save the Bitcoin market. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be right there uh, with them uh, except for 
likely returns are going to be, you know, significantly higher if history is any guide in Bitcoin than any of these other risk assets, uh, you know, knock wood. Um, and yeah, when, when the flip I, happens, it'll be glorious. But in the meantime, we're protected. I can see Poindexter, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin on CNBC right now. He's going to be like, well, Bitcoin's getting too big. We got to do something here. It, it caused the entire global economy to contract because it went down by $5 trillion in, <laughs> in two weeks. And you'll have the hankies out there talking about, you know, well, I'm, I'm at JHU. I'm super smart. Like I know this, I've been studying inflation my entire life. Right. And they're going to be the ones there on CNBC talking this and, and making a big deal. And you know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be just buying more, right? Like, you don't scare me. I've like, if there's one thing I've learned owning this stuff for as, as long as we've been in the game is the threats, the narratives, the, the false narratives, the, the narratives where they're trying to scare you is just, uh, it only cuts off one head and two, three, four, maybe at this point it'll be 10 heads per one being cut. Um, just keep on growing back. So you have to get your couple of the uh, TV screens. You have to get Sorkin on one screen and then you have to get Kramer on another screen <laughs> saying the Fed is asleep and calling for, <laughs> calling for more money printing. Uh, except while he was talking about stocks all, the last time he said that this time it'll be about Bitcoin. It's all Bitcoin's fault. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Everything's Bitcoin's fault. It's all its fault. It's all its fault. Um, yeah, I think we should call it here, guys. I, you know, I've got a couple other questions, but I think they're pretty meaty and it would probably take us another 20 minutes and I want to let you guys get back to your families. Um, so Thanks appreciate you all as usual, yeah. man. Thanks to everyone in the chat uh, and on Twitter. Great questions, guys. Uh, this is really fun. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Anytime, man. Uh, until next time, everyone. Take care. Uh, go to swansignalpodcast.com right now and make sure you're subscribed to the pod. Uh, we'll drop the audio of all of these shows there so you can get the entire archive, uh, put it on 1.52x and just catch up if you are new to the show. Uh, head over to Swan Signal, sorry, to swanbitcoin.com and start setting up an account. We make it really easy for you to start stacking Bitcoin automatically straight from your bank account. You just connect it uh, one time, set up a recurring purchase plan and just forget it. You can log back in once every few months and just see your stack growing, growing. We do all kinds of other stuff too. You can smash by uh, anytime you want. Uh, you know, you watch an episode of Swanson Get Alive and Preston Pish gets you bullish. You want to go in and smash by. Of course, you can do that. We also um, serve entities, corporations, uh, nonprofits, etc. cetera, uh, at uh, swanbitcoin.com slash private. You can sign up there. We'll also uh, create individual accounts for individuals looking to stack uh, more than $100,000 in the next 12 months. And our team of uh, incredible Bitcoiners will be there to help you along the way. You'll get access to our uh, incredible Swan uh, Private Insight monthly report, which has just been incredible. Uh, Tomer Strolight, the editor of the publication, has been knocking it out of the park. We've got uh, content coming in, exclusive content from incredible Bitcoiners all over the space, research, analysis, uh, some fun writing in there, really inspiring stuff as well. So you'll get access to that as well as all the other kind of guidance and issues on tax issues and, and stacking with your 401k, et cetera. Uh, we're going to start monthly webinars uh, with Swan. Um, uh, Swan's Managing Director of International, Stefan Lavera, he'll be hosting those. So check out Swan Private. If you know any friends and family looking to um, you know, start stacking a decent chunk or a corporation that would like to start stacking on their, on their uh, balance sheet, go to swanbitcoin.com slash private, send them our way. We'd love to have them. We'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next episode of Swan Signal Live. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. It was a lot of fun.